Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 264, Tuggy versus Date Debate, Jesus is Human and Not Divine, Part 2. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, the second half of my debate with Chris Date from May 31st, 2019. It includes mutual interrogation times, concluding statements, and audience Q&A. The first segment is my questions for Mr. Date. Mr. Date, in the process of rethinking Catholic doctrines about hell, I recall you saying that the lateness of eternal conscious torment, the lateness of the popularity of that view got your attention. Is that right? If what you mean by that is, do I think that the earliest fathers seem to teach my view of hell, then yes, that's what I think. So if you were convinced through the study of the early church fathers that we only see a Jesus who's fully divine and one of three persons in God late in the fourth century, would that also get your attention? Indeed, it would get my attention. Very good. Before you ever had children, did you want to have children? (laughs) Yes. Did you ever say something to the effect of uh, little Becky, before you were born, you were just a sparkle in my eye? Uh, No, I haven't. twinkle in my eye. uh, uh, No, I haven't. And my children are all boys, so none of them are named Becky. Uh, But no, I've, I've never said that. But yes, for the sake of argument, I'll say yes, I have. Right. So if you did that, you might even go on to talk about, you know, the twinkle leaving your mind or leaving your brain and entering the world. And I mean, that's a rough analogy of what's going on with the speculations about the inner word and the spoken word in those second century guys. So, okay, back to questions. So in the New Testament, Jesus serves God. He gets his message, his calling, his power from God. He says that God knows more. He's the mediator between God and us. Jesus says the Father is greater, the Father is his God, only God is good, he prefers God's will to his own, he dies and is raised and exalted by God. What more would Jesus have to say or do to convince you that he's not God himself and that he doesn't have divine nature? Well, since none of the things that you just read are inconsistent with the idea that Jesus is God in the way that I've said he is, um, what more would he have to say? Okay, but please answer the question, what more would he have to do or say? In some way deny that he's God. Such as saying that he's the son of God? No, such as saying I'm not God, or I'm not God incarnate, or I didn't pre-exist my, my incarnation as God, or something along those lines. If someone says he's the son of Dale Tuggy, is that, is that implicitly denying that he's Dale Tuggy? If he's a human being, yes. I mean, if he's a mere, or, or exclusive, I know you don't like the language of only or mere. If he's right, okay, we can make an exception just to Thank preserve <laughs> the theory. I understand what's happening. Okay, so do you agree with me that according to Luke in Acts 2, Peter does a great job of preaching the gospel? I don't have an encyclopedic memory of Acts chapter 2, but I'm of course going to believe that whatever Peter says there is a good representation of the gospel. I think you'll probably remember enough to agree with me that Peter doesn't say anything there whatsoever about the deity of Christ or Jesus having two natures. If he had said anything clearly there, I think I would have included it in my presentation. So no, you're probably right about that. Yeah. So will you also agree with me that the deity of Christ is not essential to the gospel message? Uh, No, I won't agree to that. I think your view then entails that Peter miserably failed. He might have tried, but he actually didn't do it. Is that a question or just a statement? Okay. Uh, Question. Um, I'm really not clear about what died on the cross exactly according to your view. Is it the divine nature, the whole composite Christ, or is it the human nature? The person through his human nature died. So dying through human nature entails dying. Yes. Dying a human death. It was the composite Christ. It was the person through the composite of his body and soul, if human beings are bodies The the two-natured person died in virtue of, was it in virtue of his human nature dying? Yes, the person by virtue of or through his human nature died. Okay, so there are two who died, there's the human nature that died, and also the composite person? No, there's one person who died through one nature. Okay, so strictly it was the person, not the nature that died. The person through his, persons... He did it through his nature. I have no idea what dying through a nature is, but I'll grant you that. So your view is that the composite was not immortal because of his divine nature? Yes, that's correct. His, his, if I understand your question, his human nature was not immortal by virtue of his divine nature. That's right. It wasn't immortal at all. He clearly died. Right. So when it says God is immortal, how do you understand that? Do you think he lost his immortality? 
No, I, and in my rebuttal, as you just watched, I explained two possible answers to that question of how he could be both mortal and immortal. One possibility is he wasn't at the same time because God is, is timeless. The other possibility is that divine and human death mean different things. Well, yeah, a lot of philosophers will tell you that at that time, what they call timelessness nowadays was actually existing at all times. And so being eternally deathless in that sense would entail being deathless at every single moment. Is that a statement um, or a question? So do you endorse the view that God is outside of time, which entails that he's incapable of any sort of change, whatever? I'm attracted to that view, yes, but I am not uh, fully on board. I would say I'm on the fence on the question of divine timelessness. Okay. And that's why I said I don't endorse either divine timelessness or two minds incarnation or whatever. Right. Do you believe that the doctrine of two natures in Jesus is a mystery in the sense that it involves an apparent contradiction? No. You don't? I don't think it's even what mystery necessarily means. Interesting. It's not what it means in the New Testament. Uh, well, obviously. Su suppose that you and I, Mr. Date, were partners in business, and we had a dispute about money, and it was so bad that you're thinking about suing me. Would you consider mediation instead as a last resort? Yes. And what would you say if I said I would be glad to serve as mediator? Hey, I'm, I'm good at it. I'm objective and fair. Would you accept me as mediator? In this hypothetical scenario, are you also me? Is your being also my being? Uh, I get to answer, yeah, ask questions. Sure. You okay. get to ask, ask questions. questions. Okay, fair enough. The answer to your question is no, because I know that you are not, your being is not my being. Right. Well, I just think a mediator is defined as a third party. Let's talk about your very difficult statements that I had trouble parsing. You use the word subsist. <laughs> By subsist, you mean exist or something like exists in the way an individual thing exists? Yes, but if you'll allow me to elaborate for just a moment, my understanding is that the early formulators of uh, how to explain the doctrines of Trinity and Incarnation mean something peculiar about the word subsist or subsistence. And it's a way of characterizing the existence of those persons in such a way as to not make them exist independently from God's being. They exist, but they exist as the one They exist true because God. of something else. So by the being of a thing, you don't mean a universal essence but rather some individual thing because of which this other thing exists as an individual substance. I I'm not sure right? I understood the question. So you've got the divine person, and you also got this thing you're calling the divine being. The substance of And it's spirit, not a right? universal, like a property, like divinity or humanity. It's an individual reality. Is that right? Yes, although there are classical theologians who would say that the difference between the substance of God and the substance of any other created thing is that God's substance simply is his properties. Right, as opposed to, but I anyway, yeah, I, yes, don't want to talk, I don't want to talk about okay. classical theism. Okay, so is it because of this divine being that the Father and Son exist as divine persons? They're divine individuals. They are selves who exist as the one being of God. Their being is right. the being of the one true God. They share it equal. Right. So I think you grant that there are differences between the Father and Son, yes? Differences in person, yes. Yeah. So the Father is not the same person as the Son, but the Father is the same person as the Father, right? Correct. So there's a difference right yes. there. Okay, so you've got different things. Each of them is divine. Why is that, in your view, not two gods? Because they're the one true they're they share the divine being. They are their being is each the one divine being. Right, but you and I share humanity, but we're still two men. That's what's, because what's different in this case? You and I are two persons who each have their own being. The Father and the Son, their being is the one being of God. They completely share the being of God. To me, this makes no sense. You're just identifying the two and then saying they're not, they're different from one another. Look, it's self evident that if we see qualitative differences between things, we know we're dealing with two things, so long as they're simultaneous. You've got simultaneous differences here between the Father and the Son. Hmm. And you've got both of them as divine beings. So there's two divine beings. There's two gods in your view. Is that a question? Is that, a question? Is that, is that, why are there not two gods in your view? Because it's one divine being they share. They, both persons exist. Do you think the one divine being is the one God? Uh, yeah. Okay. So the one divine being is not the father, but it's this thing that underlies the father. The it's father. The being of the father. That's the one God. The father yeah. and son are properly called the one God because their being is the one being of God. The one divine being. Right. Well, this is, I mean, this is the reading between the lines. The Father just is God in, in Scripture, not the divine nature. Divine nature is just properties the Father has. Is that a question? question. Nope. Okay. <laughs> 20 seconds. I think I'm pretty much out of questions. I'm going to pass it over.
just forewarning, I'm most terrible at this part of a debate, so I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Dr. Tuggy, you responded to my treatment of Matthew and the parallel in Luke by simply saying Jesus is using the imagery of protective bird's wings, but that that doesn't prove he's God. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Can you point me to any person in the ancient Near East who speaks of themselves in that, with that kind of imagery? No. Why do you think that Jesus is willing to use that to appropriate the imagery to himself, despite the fact that in the iconography and in the scriptures themselves, only God ever uses that imagery? Because he is destined to actually gather up the children of Israel as the king of the Jews ruling under the one God. Do you think that there were people prior to Jesus who sought to do that kind of thing? No, it doesn't matter. Look, this is hint hunting. This is not serious interpretation. Okay, so, look look so at any study Bible. You're not going to find this type of interpretation on that verse. Okay, just to be clear, though, you're saying it's insignificant that Jesus self-appropriates imagery that throughout the ancient Near East was only ever used of God. Yes, there are lots okay. of titles that's and okay. words that's, that are that's used right. for Jesus So God. the next question I have for you is regarding Philippians 2. You mm-hmm. said that if you had more time, you would defend your Adamic uh, Christology there. Can you point me to any linguistic basis, any connection to any relevant literature in which uh, human beings are said to be in the Marfei of God? No. Can you but point do you me? Want, you don't want me to defend it right now, I take it, so I'll. Uh, well, maybe we'll get there. Just we'll say see. no. Yeah. Uh, the second question is there anywhere in the relevant literature in which Adam is said to have tried to attain equality with God using a word that means something like equal to? Not that I know of. Okay. Do you know of any object complement constructions in which harpagmas or harpagma is used as the object complement with a verb of consideration or regarding some sort of mental thing where, the, where that word means something other than an advantage to use? Yes. Uh, half the translators seem to think that it means grasping after something that one does not already have. It's an I'm, unusual word. So I'm, I'm asking about, I'm, I'm not asking about the very verse we're, we're parsing. I'm talking mm-hmm. about anywhere else no. where, no. Okay. No. Can you, do we normally consider it humble for somebody who is in an inferior position to not seek to usurp, and as we've already seen, that's not what the language says anyway, usurp the privileges of a superior. Do we, ever, do we talk about that as, as humility? Absolutely, yes. James White is just wrong about that. Okay. So human beings, whatever our positions of authority, whatever, we are equal, correct? Equal in terms of ontology. We're, we're equally bearers of the divine image, equally uh, Yeah, ontologically we're equal. Yes. I mean, parent, you got parents and children and kings and subjects and all that's that. Right. Right. And you would agree, would you not, that it would be humble for somebody in a position of greater authority, but who is nevertheless ontologically equal, to humble himself and serve the one who is in a lower position of authority possibly, but is nevertheless equal? Uh, If you're asking me, would Jesus be humble if he did what he did on your reading of Philippians 2, yes, I think that kind of spectacular bringing oneself down would be humble. Okay. But it's also humble just to stay in your lane and not think too highly of yourself and do what's proper to a person like you. Okay. We've talked about the actual language Paul uses there. And in my, in my case, I talked about the, the tenses of the participles. I talked about the synonymous nature of form of God and equality with God. I talked about a lot of that and I had that diagram at the end with the timeline and everything. Can you explain how any reading, any Unitarian reading which denies that Jesus is deity, that can account for all of the data that I presented? Yeah, there are actually two of them, but I'm not going to be able to explain them in this short Q&A time. Um, what if you took... Uh, we can talk about Morphe, we can talk about let's start the with whole Morphe. sequence and the logic of it. Right, so Morphe in the Septuagint is used to refer to an observable appearance. But they never, talk about an idol being in the morphe of a man. Sure, but now, obviously it's not a defining essence because an idol is not a man. Sure, but as you acknowledged, in Greek philosophy, form could mean what it you're could. saying. It doesn't mean yes. here. And yeah. you, we've already agreed that morphe in the relevant literature is nowhere ever used to describe human beings in God's form. Correct. Um, Can you yes, think of any besides Philippians two? Well, you know, Old Testament scholars tell you that Adam and Eve being made in the image and likeness of God in that day was interpreted literally like they're like him structurally. Like if you were to see God, right. you'd see this humanoid thing. And But the and question I'm asking see. is, can you point and to so, any literature in which no, human but look, beings it's are a, said it's to be a in a the It's a fallacy to think that Paul can't say something unless earlier people said it. This is an exegetical fallacy. Sure, but we exegete in light of how the language was used by contemporaries, yes, correct? But, well, so sure, is there any contemporary? But, but have, I'm asking the question right my, now. Is yes, there, that is, is correct, a, but we do have to consider the logic of the passage. That's super important. Okay. That's probably um, most and, important. And we've also acknowledged that there's nobody in the relevant literature who speaks of Adam as having tried to attain some sort of equality with God, correct? Can you point me to any, any uh, language which communicates that besides Philippians I mean, two? this would be an example of it. 
So, Besides but Philippians again, 2, you, you can't... What, you can't what, what matters is what makes best sense of the whole passage in Paul's context. Okay. Let's talk about the passage in Hebrews. Is there anywhere in which the author of Hebrews uses the language of creating ages to refer to anything other than the Genesis creation? Yes, I think it's in chapter 1, verse... Uh, where is it? Verse 2, through whom he created the ages. So you're telling me the one place where he does that is in the very passage we're disputing? Yeah, because the whole context of Hebrews 1, uh, he even says something to this effect in chapter 2, but the whole context of 1 is these last days. I thought you might go to chapter 2 because you've pointed Mm -hmm. out that he says in in chapter 2 that the world about which we are speaking, Mm -hmm. do you know what Greek word that is? Uh, Off the top of my head, no. It's, it's the Greek word that is, uh, from which we get the word economy. He's not mm-hmm. talking about, he never talks about ages using the language that he uses at the beginning of Hebrews that I cited. And in fact, where that word first shows up is later in Hebrews 1, well after the introductory sentences. So again, the question I have for you is, is there anywhere in which there's evidence that the author of Hebrews is talking about something other than the Genesis creation in the passage I cited? I mean, the evidence is that it makes best sense of what's going on in chapter 1. If you think that Jesus is the author of a new creation, you're going to use creation language. It's not a problem. Are this there, is exactly what Paul does. Does he ever use poieto to describe Jesus creating an age? Why does it matter? Because words this matter. This seems like the same fallacy, right? Okay. So you, make, so, you, you learn so the words used by how so it's being just to be used clear, in their context. Just to be clear, you've agreed that when it comes to the actual words that are used, there's no precedent for your reading, Correct. I'm not talking about the concepts. You I'm not can, sure you which precedent you're asking about. The precedent. Now. Okay, so the, okay. Let's go, let's go back to, to the argument to refer that I made. To new creation let's in go back, Hebrews. Is let's that go back. The precedent? Let's go back I'm to the sorry. argument that I made. There were three reasons I offered for rejecting your interpretation, and I want to know which of these you either think is insignificant or that you dispute. Number one, the author of Hebrews himself uses poieto to describe the Genesis creation later in Hebrews 12. Yes, you agree? insignificant. Then you agree that the language of the, the ages, the author of Hebrews says later, is a reference to the universe that God created, correct, in chapter 11? I do think he's talking about the Genesis creation in chapter 11. Using the same words, yeah. the ages that he mm-hmm. uses in Hebrews 1. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you would agree, would you not, that the author of Hebrews throughout the book of Hebrews refers not only to ages present and future, but also past, correct? Um, I don't Jesus think in chapter appeared at the end 1, of the, no. But in, but in his is. book. But later, yeah, when he's talking about the Genesis creation. Okay, so you're, if I'm understanding you correctly, your response to that argument is just those three things don't matter. It doesn't matter uh, how the author yeah. himself... Okay. Yeah, that's basically right. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, let's then talk about theology. You said that a mediator must, by definition, be a third party. I think that's a bit of an assumption. I think it could also be a person who shares both natures. But putting that aside, how is it just for somebody who has been uh, sinned against or had a crime committed to, against them to not punish the person who committed the crime and not to absorb the loss himself, but to punish some third party in their place. Is, is there any accounting for which that could be deemed just? I mean, I think this is an objection to substitutionary atonement theories, but I don't think it's an objection to other atonement theories. So it is strange to think that if I'm going to forgive somebody, I then have to exercise my wrath on somebody else. But the question is, does God have to exercise his wrath on somebody for atonement to work? And other views don't have that. Okay, but so just to be clear, you can't offer me an example in which a third party is substituting for the people who have committed the crime and Mm -hmm. for the person to whom the crime, against whom the crime, there's no precedent for it at all. Sure, it's hard to see how that's That's just, but it's also hard to see how the self-insertion would be just. Because the self-person, the the person uh, substituting is both, is absorbing the loss himself and bearing the penalty that his uh, humans deserve being incarnate. That's my time. When the Trinity's podcast returns, concluding statements. There's been more than I can address. I mean, I hope somebody asks about John 1 uh, in the questions. Uh, in conclusion, I have shown that an actual New Testament teaching, as opposed to later teachings which human traditions impose on the text, aggressively reading between the lines, yes, Jesus is a man and is not also divine in the way that the one God is divine. 
If you think like I do that the Bible is inspired scripture, you should be hesitant to read between the lines. Christian history has shown that scripture can all too easily be distorted when it is read through later lenses. Thus, the Roman Catholic thinks that in Matthew 16, Jesus makes Peter the first pope. And he thinks that in John 6, Jesus is teaching that the wafer and the wine are literally his own body and blood. Such innovations should be rolled back in favor of contextual first century readings of New Testament texts. In this debate, I focused on clear and often explicit New Testament teaching, according to which the Father is the one true God, and so is the only divine being, whereas Jesus is a man, his unique son, his Messiah. Two nature speculations are a mess. They either present us with two Jesuses, a divine person plus a man, or they present us with one Jesus who only appears to be a human because he's really a divine self puppeteering a soul and body. And if the divine and human natures are merely essential qualities, I showed in my opening statement how such a theory implies four contradictions. And you'll have to be the judge for yourselves whether you think Mr. Date's explanations show how those are consistent. Now, I'm sure that some of you have been conditioned to celebrate such contradictions as mysteries. To this, I would point out out that the New Testament authors never defend problematic claims in this way. Most importantly, biblical texts carefully read never teach that Jesus is one person with two natures. For this conclusion, we're only given rickety and unconvincing arguments. In the Bible, Jesus is neither the same God as the Father, nor is he a different God than the Father, because he's not a God. He's the Son of God. And like you, he's subject to the one true God, God the Father. I want to end by giving you some practical reasons why it's important for us to further reform Christian doctrine and practice in this way. Since the latter portion of the second century, mainstream Christian thinking has always planted one foot squarely on the false teaching called docetism. Docetism is the view that Jesus only appears to be a man, but is not really a man. As we've seen, two natures theorists will say that Jesus is a real man, or at least that he's human, but they will also say that he is divine, which entails not being a man. So they give with one hand and take away with the other. They intend not to present a docetic Christology, but they say things which imply a docetic Christology. This ambivalence of mainstream Christology goes right back to the second century, right back to the time when some elites were deciding that a mere man Christology was obviously wrong. Like some of the Gnostics, the extremely influential origin taught that on the cross there was a man who died, even while another being, an eternal divine self, went on living. Mainstream Christian theology has largely moved away from a view like Origins, but theologically educated Christians usually have confused views about who died on the cross. Either like Michael Brown, they contradict scripture by denying that Jesus died, or like modern kenosis theorists, they deny that full divinity implies essential immortality, or they scrape around trying to find someone who could die here. Maybe the body died, maybe the human nature died, but such claims make no sense. To lose a human life, you have to have a human life, and to have a human life is to be a human being. And those things, the body and the human nature, are not supposed to be human beings, according to two natures theorists. As a last refuge, some invent unintelligible language saying that the God the Son tasted death or experienced human death or died as a man but lived as God. Now, if you say that he died as a man, unless that involves actually dying, I don't know what you mean. But then we're back to this problem of an essentially immortal being dying. The simple, understandable New Testament doctrine is that he was a man, that he was mortal at the beginning, and then he died, and he breathed his last. He assumed room temperature, just like you and I will do someday, unless Jesus comes back first. As Paul teaches in Philippians 2, and of course, this is his actual main point, this death is a uniquely beautiful and inspiring example for us, an example of faithful service to God. The best thing you and I can do with our lives is to spend them all the way doing God's will, even if this means that we go down in flames to an early death. He sees and he remembers, and just as he raised his unique son, so he will also raise you and me, disciples of his son. Jesus' faith, his trust in God, is a clear yet neglected New Testament theme. It's one we're blinded to so long as we imagine that Jesus is God himself or that he's divine. A divine being who's self-sufficient, omnipotent, and omniscient has no need of faith in God. Thankfully, it's a recent tradition to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? He is our best example. But if we think that Jesus is fully divine, among other things, essentially omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and so utterly immune from temptation, we will not really consider him to be an example to emulate.
We find it hard to imagine what it's like to go through life with those qualities. But the New Testament Jesus is an example we can fully embrace. For truly our permanent high priest is sympathetic to our struggles, having passed similar tests himself. When we feel unworthy to approach God, truly we can call upon the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, and we can thereby come to enjoy peace with God. Jesus is a third party who really does mediate between us and our God. Thus, we have no need of pope, bishop, priest, or any other sort of guru to lead us to God. It was people who believed in the deity of Christ, who felt that they needed the intercession of Mary, various dead saints or monks or nuns, especially holy people like hermits or whatever, in order to approach God. But this new covenant gives us all the heavenly friends we need. As John says, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Notice he's not being redundant. There are two objects of fellowship here. These two deserve unconfused worship. You should only thank the Father for being the creator of the cosmos, even if you think he did it through the pre-human Jesus, and you should only thank the Son for dying for us. When you confuse together two different beings, you mix up their characteristics, so that you end up to some extent misunderstanding both of them. Thus, despite the New Testament, many attribute omniscience, essential immortality, or being the creator to the man Jesus. Others, trying to be consistent, lower God down to a human level so that God can be limited in knowledge or so that God can die. And beyond theology, the confusion of Jesus with God also damages our general picture or our general mental image of God so that our emotional responses to God are off. The imagined Jesus God is no longer the fearsome king of the universe, the heavenly father, the almighty. Rather, God turns out to be this nice Jewish man maybe five foot two with a neat beard, some sandals. He loves children, not a threatening character. The New Testament says that Jesus is our friend. Yes, even our brother. So when we confuse Jesus with God, we think God is our friend and our brother. God is not and can't possibly be our brother. He's not a member of the human race, but rather the eternal creator of it. Yes, dear Christian, God is our friend who wishes us well, but this is not anything like an equal friendship, but it's like the relationship between an emperor and his faithful servant, or a general and his soldier, or a perfect father and his child. He's the boss, and our role is to find his will and to obey. Jesus knew this and lived it out perfectly. His achievements are truly mind-blowing, and he is still at work this day. When you realize that he is a mere man, that is, a person who is human and not also divine, this should remind you that when God is involved, mere humans can do astounding things. Jesus' amazing victories were the victories of a man whom God filled with his spirit without measure. And if you are a Christian, Jesus has now given that same spirit to you. We should receive it. We should rely on it. We should thank him for it. Thank you. I'd like once again to thank Dr. Tuggy for agreeing to engage me in debate on this topic, Uh, and I'd also like to thank Keegan Chandler for moderating our debate, the organizers and sponsors for making it possible, all my friends who helped me to prepare for it, and even some people I hardly know who helped me prepare for it, as well as ICFIS Publications, the publisher of Dr. Tuggy's and my forthcoming Two Views book, in which we'll expand upon our debate tonight in written form. Now, A closing statement isn't the place to introduce additional evidence and argumentation, but rather to summarize for the audience what one thinks has transpired. So let me attempt to do that now. In his opening presentation, Dr. Tuggy suggested that early Lagos speculators believed the son was brought into existence by the father. But as I demonstrated in my rebuttal, not only do some of the fathers explicitly deny that, like Athenagoras and like Justin Martyr, who explicitly excluded Jesus from the category of all creatures, but I also demonstrated that Dr. Tuggy confuses the categories with which these early fathers speak about God begetting his word rather than God creating his word. Dr. Tuggy also claimed that I read my Christology from between the lines of Scripture, and he argued that the lines of Scripture themselves teach that the incarnate Son is a limited human being who called the Father the only true God. Of course, I agree with those things, all Trinitarians agree with those things, and they are precisely what believers believers in the Trinity and incarnation like me would expect the incarnate Son to do. 
But in my rebuttal, I demonstrated that Dr. Tuggy is the one who's reading Unitarianism into the text of Scripture, between the lines of Scripture, in order to avoid texts which teach the pre-existence and deity of the Son, in order to conclude that the texts he cites rules out Christ's deity. As I demonstrated, they don't, they don't do any such thing. Finally, Dr. Tuggy argued that the Trinitarian doctrine of incarnation is self-contradictory and therefore unintelligible, but I demonstrated in my rebuttal that the contradictions he accuses my view of entailing are only contradictions if one assumes Unitarianism, shrinks God down to human size, and ignores the part of the law of non-contradiction that denies the possibility of A and not A at the same time and in the same sense. In fact, all throughout his closing argument, he kept talking about Jesus is, is mortal, so he can't be God. But as I demonstrated, there is no violation in saying that Jesus was both mortal and immortal, provided it wasn't in the, at the same time and in the sense, in same sense. The reality is none of Dr. Tuggy's arguments for the exclusive humanity of Jesus held up to scrutiny. None of them. So, in my opening presentation, I demonstrated from the early ecumenical councils, which, yeah, granted, are not as early as earlier writers. Of course, that's the case. I'm not dumb. But I also quoted people from the very early second century and from the middle and latter part of the second century as well, all of whom believed that the deity and incarnation of Christ has been definitional of Christianity and that it has been from the very beginning. Dr. Tuggy rebutted that by pointing you to some language that he thinks indicates that early fathers thought Jesus was brought into existence by the Father, but as I demonstrated, this confuses the categories with which the early fathers speak. I went on to demonstrate that Paul, the author of Hebrews, Matthew, and Jesus himself teach that Jesus pre-existed his incarnation as Yahweh, the creator God. Dr. Tuggy's response to all this was basically just to say, all of the things that I demonstrated are completely insignificant. It doesn't matter that Jesus has absolutely no precedent for applying the imagery of protective birds, prevalent throughout the ancient Near East to refer to, refer to deity, to do it to himself. Ignore that, it doesn't matter. When it came to Paul in Philippians 2, it doesn't matter to Dr. Tuggy at all that there's utterly no linguistic basis for the Adamic Christology reading that Dr. Tuggy has. It doesn't matter that Paul treats form of God and equality with God as synonymous. It doesn't matter that Jesus was in the form of God at the time that he then became a human being. It didn't address the language of, becoming, of being born in the likeness of men at all, at all. When it came to Hebrews, once again, it doesn't matter that the author of Hebrews uses the language of poieo to describe the Genesis creation later in Hebrews. It doesn't matter that the author of Hebrews uses the language of tusionos, the ages, to refer to the universe having been created by God later in, the, in Hebrews. It doesn't matter that the author of Hebrews speaks of ages not only present and future, but also past and says that the Son created them all. None of this matters. Just look the other way. That was the response to Hebrews, and it was the response to Philippians, and it was the response to Jesus. None of this matters, just trust that Unitarianism is true. Next, I argued that if God is the most loving of all beings, and if God is just in his means of accomplishing salvation, then Jesus must indeed be incarnate God, since he performed the greatest act of love possible and absorbed believers' sin debt himself. God did not unjustly subject an innocent third party to death. When it came to my argument about the greatest act of love possible, Dr. Tuggy didn't address that. Maybe that'll come up in Q&A. But as far as I can tell, Jesus, in Dr. Tuggy's view, Jesus performed an act of love even greater than anything God can do. Why? Because God can't become a human being. Where's the basis for that? He's alleged that, it's con that it introduces uh, contradictions, that it causes violations in the law of non-contradiction. And I demonstrated that that's simply false. So there simply is no reason to think that God could not become a man and perform the greatest act of love possible. And in fact, Christianity posits that he did. And when it comes to whether or not God was just in sub subjecting a third party, an innocent third party, to a death that the rest of humankind deserved, Dr. Tuggy admits there's no precedent for that. It would seem odd to all of us if for to subject an innocent third party to death when other people are the ones who committed the crimes and we are the ones against whom those crimes were committed. He says, yeah, that's right, and yet we still, we just have to believe it. And his basis was that a mediator is a third party. Well, that's just a bald assertion. It's simply a bald assertion. Equally possible is that Jesus can be mediator, not because he's a third party, but because he's both God and human. In fact, I would argue that that's the biblical picture of mediation in, when it comes to Christ, that he is a mediator because he is both the God against whom humanity has sinned, and he is the, uh, a human being uh, and, and is fully capable of abiding by the Old Testament law, and so on and so forth. Finally, concluding my case proper, I argued that in the historic Christian doctrine of incarnation, God the Son dies saving his people like a heroic father dying to save his children, which Paul, by the way, indicates in Philippians 2 is meant to inspire God's image bearers to likewise take the role of the slave to serve others. 
And this is more beautiful and inspiring than the, than the Unitarian God in Dr. Tuggy's view. Dr. Tuggy just denied that. And that's fine. He just said, Chris doesn't appreciate how I understand Jesus to have died. But there was no explanation. There was no addressing the actual argument that I made, which is that the view that God is the one who, like a heroic father, dies in place of his children, that, is a, a, that maximally inspires human beings to act with humility in the way he did. So basically, a human being who is not God maximally inspires us to be a servant, according to Dr. Tuggy's view, whereas historic Christianity maintains God. God is the maximal demonstration of that kind of humility and selfless service. And then at the end, after I offered all this evidence in favor of understanding Jesus to be both human and divine, I explained why, from a Trinitarian perspective, this doctrine of incarnation is intelligible and coherent. And by my estimation, Dr. Tuggy just continued to repeat the claim that it's not, but never actually offered evidence for it, except for the evidence I rebutted in my rebuttal, which is that no aspect of the doctrines of Trinity and Incarnation are, in fact, uh, unintelligible or incoherent, provided that you include the qualifications on the law of non-contradiction, which is that two things can't both be and not be at the same time and at the same place. Dr. Tuggy told you you should dismiss the doctrine of divine timelessness because of a lot of other people do. Yeah, well, big deal. A lot of people don't believe in the deity of Christ, and a lot of us do. And then he didn't even address the other options I gave, like the two minds view of incarnation or like the difference between divine and human death, weren't even addressed at all. He just continued to assert and insist baldly that the doctrine I've been presenting to you is unintelligible and incoherent. So when all is said and done, the case I presented for the deity and incarnation of Christ remains fundamentally unchallenged. And since the doctrines of Trinity and Incarnation are intelligible, albeit mysterious, therefore we can and must answer tonight's debate question, no, Jesus is human and divine. I look forward to your questions in Q&A after the break, and uh, please do consider purchasing our book because both of us will have an awful lot more time to expand upon the arguments that we've offered here and to better rebut one another than, than we've had to here today. So please do be on the lookout for that. It should be published later this year. And once again, I just want to thank you, Dr. Tuggy, so much for stooping down to my level to engage with me in this debate and this topic. It's certainly not my wheelhouse. I hope that I've presented my view well and the view of most Christians. But again, I'm humbled and honored that you would consider me worthy of debating. Thank you so much. When the Trinity's podcast returns, audience questions as fielded and posed by moderator Keegan Chandler. Okay, looks like we're all settling in here. Thank you so much for this great level of audience participation. We've got lots of great questions here. I'm going to be alternating questions for our debaters here. The person to whom the question is directed will receive two minutes to answer, and the other gentleman will then receive one minute to provide his response. Okay, the uh, first question is for Dr. Tuggy. You wanted someone to ask you about John 1. Thus, how do you think John 1 supports your affirmative that Jesus is human and not divine? I mean, I think all of John supports my view that he's human and not divine. Not so much this one in particular, but I think this is one of the most misunderstood bits in the New Testament. What I understand John 1 to be, the famous portion that we're talking about, it's basically a commentary on Genesis using Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8 talks about a lady named Wisdom. And she's there with God when God creates and seems to be something like a helper. There's a history of associating God's wisdom with God's word. It's in other literature before John was written. And so they kind of equate God's word and God's wisdom. So in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, like wisdom in Proverbs 8. And in Greek, theos ain halagos, God was the word. I think he's telling you it's not somebody else. I don't agree with the reading that he's saying the Word is a God. I think he's saying, no, the Word is just God, okay? But now he goes back to personifying. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Without him, there was not one thing that came into being. The one thing that's confusing about this passage is that it talks about John the Baptist in the middle of it. 
But there's an earlier precedent in literature like Sirach and other books for something heavenly like God's Torah coming down and living among us. And it's God's eternal word by which he made all things, Psalm 33, 6, that we see in the man Jesus. That's why he says the word became flesh and dwelled among us. It's not like a ghost gaining a body. It's that something eternal and divine, which is God's word, was manifest in this man, the greatest revelation of God. So I don't have a lot to say about John 1. If I thought that this passage was sort of the uh, knockdown, drag out proof of my position, I would have cited it. But I do think it's interesting that the author, it doesn't say God is the word, it says the word is deity. If you read somebody like Daniel Wallace, he'll, he'll explain the, the construction there. But either way, I, I think that the explanation that Dr. Tuggy has offered is at least plausible, except that the author goes on to call Jesus the unique God, or the only God who is at the Father's side. And I don't think that Dr. Tuggy's reading accounts for that, except to say, well, yeah, he's calling him the unique God, but not God God. He doesn't do that. So I would reject Dr. Tuggy's reading, but I don't have a real strong opinion uh, about it, and that's why I didn't discuss it in this debate. Mr. Date. One of our audience members would like to know, why do you think that the Bible often makes a distinction not just between the Father and Jesus, but between God and Jesus? Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's, as Dr. Tuggy has pointed out very often, the term God is usually used by New Testament authors to refer to the Father. It's not that they are contrasting God the being with the Son. He's, they're contrasting God the Father with the Son. Now, why is it that they weren't equally comfortable throwing the word God around to describe the Son? Well, I would argue that at least the emphasis of New Testament Christianity is, in fact, the human incarnation and, and death and resurrection of Christ. If he were merely God, then he would fail to satisfy the requirements needed to live out the, the law as a human being that we humans are supposed to do, and he would fail to be able to stand to substitute as the atoning sacrifice so that we don't have to die ourselves. So the emphasis is indeed on Jesus' humanity, and I think that's why New Testament authors are comfortable using the word God to refer to the Father, and rarely for the Son. But I don't think that it follows from that that what they're doing is contrasting Jesus with God. If my view is right, as I've repeatedly said tonight, and as any Trinitarian will tell you, the way Jesus speaks about and to God is totally consistent with what we Trinitarians would expect in the incarnate God the Son to do. There's no surprise there. There's nothing strange or bizarre about it. Unless you think, number one, that God could not possibly become incarnate, as Dr. Tuggy has argued, but I would argue without foundation, or if you think that if God were to become incarnate, he would be an atheist or a polytheist, then I think you've got a problem, but I don't think that God incarnate would do either of those things. So, yeah, I just don't think there is any contrast between Jesus and God. There's a contrast between Jesus and God the Father. That's my answer. I mean, I think the New Testament authors are constantly and continually contrasting Jesus and God. They usually do this with the word and. So if you look at the start of any of Paul's letters, he sends greetings from the two of them. And if they're just the same being, that's redundant. That would be like me sending you a Christmas card from Dale and also from Dr. Tuggy. You say, what's wrong with that guy? Right, so the greetings from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, they really are from two. And that's why John says our fellowship is with two. The Father in the New Testament is just who Yahweh turns out to be. That's the one God of the Old Testament. So that's why they usually use the word God for the Father. And I showed this in my debate with Michael Brown in the first 20 minutes, if you want to see the facts there that heavily support that the one God is the Father and refute that the one God is the Trinity, um, you can consult those indisputable facts. All right. Dr. Tuggy, one of our audience members would like to know if you can explain begotten God in John 1.18, or the phrase begotten God in some translations of John 1.18. Yeah, this is a a strange statement. I mean, why would you say there's only one begotten God? The traditional interpretation, which a lot of Trinitarians are running away from now, is that this refers to eternal generation, this eternal dependence relation where the Logos exists because of the Father in some mysterious fashion that's not creation. Nowadays, they've switched to thinking, well, no, maybe this is, although this is Protestants more than others, no, this is an idiom that just means uh, unique. Only begotten just means unique. It's not really telling you about the origin of the thing. Some manuscripts, of course, have only son here, but not the earliest and best manuscripts. Uh, 
So just going by the rules of textual criticism, the majority want to say that you have to read it as only begotten God. You could do that. We know from this very gospel, according to Jesus in John 10, that beings who are not God and who do not have divine nature can be called God. It'd be strange to call him the only God or the only begotten God, because gods aren't begotten. He is unique, but he's not unique in being God. The Father is unique in being God, according to the constant view of the New Testament. So yeah, it's a strange textual problem. Uh, It could be saying he's the only begotten God, but in any case, this gospel doesn't confuse him with the one true God, the Father, John 17, 1 through 3. So really briefly, I just want to point out, uh, based on Dr. Tuggy's answer, his follow-up to my answer to the last question, a lot of Unitarians get frustrated when Trinitarians accuse Unitarians of assuming Unitarianism, but that's precisely how he followed up to my answer to the last question. He continued to just assume that there is no distinction between person and being, and I would just encourage you not to make the same assumption. As for John, I don't have a lot to say other than that it is interesting that Dr. Tuggy seems to think there's really no significance to the fact that John calls the Son the only God, the unique God. But I will say that it's not the case that the Gospel of John consistently shows Jesus is exclusively human. I cited one passage in which Jesus says, I came from the Father and I'm going to the Father. And here's an example where Dr. Tuggy has to read between the lines and say, well, one of those is literal, but the other is missional. And I would just encourage you to take a little more care with, uh, with the word. All right, Mr. Date. In Mark 10, 18, Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So I'm glad that this passage comes up. This is often leveled as if it's an argument against the deity of Christ, against the doctrine of the Trinity, but I don't see why, and there's a really important reason why I don't see why. Jesus does not here claim not to be good. Quite the contrary, the whole New Testament, it was all about the goodness of Jesus. I would just posit that what Jesus is doing is calling the uh, interlocutor's attention to the fact that he's saying Jesus is good, and he's asking, think about the significance of that. Think about the significance of calling me good when only God is good. Now, if Jesus had gone on to say, don't call me good, I'm not good, only God is good, well, then you'd have an argument for Unitarianism. But apart from that, you just do not have one. And I think uh, any Trinitarian will tell you what sure sounds an awful lot like what Jesus is doing is calling the questioner's attention to the fact that if it is true that only God is good, and if you're comfortably calling me good, why do you think that is? That's my treatment of the passage. Yeah, I mean, look, he said no one's good but God alone, and by that he means the Father alone. He doesn't have to repeat that to be saying that. And that's, I think, what Mr. Date just said. Uh, He is implying here that he's not good in the sense that the one God is good. Some ancient interpreters like Origen, most of them just accepted, uh, before the round Nicaea, around the 4th century, they just accepted this. And they said, well, by good, he must mean like good by his essence or the source of all goodness or some special sense of goodness. There are good men and women. He's good as Messiah, yes, but he's not good in the special sense that the only, only the one God is good. He must mean something like that because, yes, he just said only God is good, and by that he means the Father, and he's not the Father. Okay, Dr. Tuggy, is it possible that Jesus gave up his immortality, omniscience, etc., when becoming a man, that he emptied himself of these divine qualities? So the tradition, which goes back to Chalcedon, which I mentioned, is that by this mysterious union of the divine human nature, none of the typical or defining qualities of either one of the natures is changed. And it's traditionally been understood that divine nature that God has includes omniscience and omnipotence. Was there another one? omnibenevolence. Um, So no, they would not be losable according to Chalcedon. If you ask me what I think, yeah, I think God is the greatest being there could be. So I think he's good and couldn't become less good. I think he knows all and couldn't fail to know something that's true. He's got the greatest sort of power there is and couldn't lose that. This idea that God could lose divine attributes or the exercise of them or anyway something or in that area is called kenosis theory, and it was made up in the 1800s by German and British theologians who were all of a sudden concerned to portray Jesus as a real man, not an all-knowing, all-powerful God that's faking it. And that's, in fact, what a lot of Christians think. I mean, they think he's just kind of hiding his divine power and his divine knowledge and his untemptabilities, kind of just play-acting for us. 
They started to not like that, this idea of fakery in the 1800s. So that maybe he gave up divine attributes. You can't give up essential divine attributes by definition. So they say stuff like, well, maybe he gave up the exercise of them. Look, it doesn't matter if you gave up the exercise of omniscience. If you go around telling people you don't know the day and the hour of your future return, you're a liar. What does it even mean to not use your omniscience? I don't even know what that means. Like you forget it temporarily, but you really do know it. Uh, if you know it in one mind, but not in the other, you're a liar if you say that. Because he knows that they're just going to infer that he doesn't know it in any way. I have very little to add to what Dr. Tucky says. I actually think he's fundamentally right about what he said. And the kenosis theory is, I think, a really bad reading of that passage that I spent so much time in in my opening. When Paul says Jesus emptied himself, there's no nothing in context that would suggest that he's emptying himself of his divine attributes or of his exercise thereof. So I think it's a bad reading, and I don't think it's good theology. However, you'll note that in my rebuttal to Dr. Tuggy's opening presentation, I didn't appeal to kenosis. I offered the doctrine of divine timelessness, and I offered the doctrine of two minds incarnation neither of which Dr. Tuggy responded to, except to say a lot of people think those are dumb. And I would just encourage you to take these things a little more seriously. Mr. Day, this one is going to require you getting your Bible out. You've been asked by an audience member to read for us John 10, 33 through 36, and to explain why, if Jesus was God, he did not make it clear at that time, rather than stating, I am God's Son. No, I'm not. <laughs> Whether or not my reading qualifies as good, I'll leave up to Dr. Tuggy. I'll do my best. Verse 33 of John chapter 10 begins, The Jews answered him, that is Jesus, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. This is verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture, of course, cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? So why didn't he make this clear? Well, you know, um, I prefer not to speculate about what Jesus chooses not to do or what authors of Scripture choose not to say, but I will tell you that not answering his interlocutors directly is part and parcel. I mean, it's, it's Jesus' modus operandi. He even says in places that he's, he's intentionally speaking in a way that's not direct and clear in order that people who are not as sheep, people who are not uh, truly listening to hear God won't make sense of what he's saying. So Jesus himself says that he speaks in ways that aren't always going to directly communicate an answer, because those people who truly want to follow him, who truly have ears to hear, will hear what he's saying, even if he doesn't come out directly and say it. So is it possible that Jesus could have been clearer here? Sure. But so what? That has absolutely no relevance to the, the debate question that we're debating tonight. I think what Jesus does here is really clear, and it's really brilliant. He argues from the Pharisees' own presuppositions. Uh, he says, in your view, they called these people to whom the word of God came gods. Now, I'm greater than those guys, but I'm not even being called a god, which it, you can translate that way earlier, or a god or god. I won't dispute it either way. I'm not calling myself a god or god, the one god. I'm calling myself the son of god. Okay, so you can't say, well, the Jews understood what he was really claiming. No, they didn't. The Jews are like clowns that are constantly blowing it all through the book of John in the middle part. They're always like misunderstanding. What, I have to go back into my mother? What, I, what, I have to cannibalize you? They misunderstand him here, and he corrects him. Just like at the end of the book, this, these things are written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ. Mr. Date, in which verse or passage does the word God mean all three persons at once, I presume from either the Old Testament or New Testament. I don't know of any use of the word God that refers to all three persons simultaneously. Um, I think we'd have to do some extremely careful exegesis of certain passages. I think it's possible that when Jesus says in that passage, somebody asked me about earlier, where Jesus says only God is good, I think it's possible that's a reference to the being of God. But I'm perfectly comfortable accepting that God is, by and large, a reference to only God the Father. I don't think that one has to find a place where God refers to all three persons simultaneously or to the being as distinct from the persons in order to accept the argument that I've offered tonight for Christ's deity. So I'm sorry I don't have a more meaningful answer to that question, but as far as I can tell, the question is, doesn't have a lot of significance when it comes to this debate.
What I was told years ago when I first started looking into this by some Reformed fellows, I can't remember who exactly, was that whenever Scripture says God and it doesn't specifically have something about the Father or Son in view, then it must mean the Trinity. Um, this is not what serious scholars think. This is not what textual scholars think. And this is really powerful evidence that they just didn't have a concept of a trinity. If they had a concept of a trinity, they would have, a, a triune God, that is, they would have come up with some word or just a phrase, anything, the triple God, the three of them together, and use that to refer to the one God. And they don't. There's hardly anything that even sounds like that in the New Testament. The best people can do are these triadic passages, but then you just have God being mentioned usually as the first member. So, yeah, I talk about this as evidence again in my prior debate. Dr. Tuggy, can you explain what the likeness of men refers to in Philippians 2? I think it refers to uh, being in what you could call the human condition. I think it's saying the same thing as uh, taking on the morphe of a slave. And so, in other words, it's, it's a way of saying that he's a man like other men. It's a little bit of a strange phrase. I mean, you might think that calling him in the likeness of men would suggest that he's not a man. I don't think you're to take it that way, because as I pounded the table on in this debate, he's explicitly a man. And so that's just something that Paul is assuming here. So being in the likeness of men is sharing the human condition, being subject to temptation, fear, doubt, you know, wondering what God's will is, uh, having people aggravate you, getting rained upon all these things. He wasn't striding around like some Superman, you know, whose farts don't stink or something like that, or who never really has any problems or any serious difficulties. Yeah, that's what I think it means. By the way, I don't know why one would assume that a Superman would have non-stinky farts. It could very well be that a Superman's farts are the most devastatingly smelly as possible. At least my kids would probably think so. Paul doesn't here only say that, Ad that Jesus uh, became in the likeness of men. He also says he, was, he, he became in human form. And what he says is that this is the means by which he emptied himself. So Dr. Tuggy is right. Being born or becoming in the likeness of men become, means he takes on the human condition, if, if that's how he wants to put it. But the point is, he does that in the emptying of himself, meaning he wasn't a human being prior to the point in time at which he emptied himself, as I demonstrated in my opening presentation. And, and not only that, what Paul does is he say that, says that being in the form of God and being equal with God are essentially the same thing. Jesus was in the form of God, but did not consider his equality with God something to take advantage of. And I don't think that's even really been rebutted today. When the Trinity's podcast returns, an audience member asks about who the one creator of the Old Testament is. Mr. Date, since Isaiah 44:24 says, by myself I created, which person or self alone is creator? I don't think a person or self alone is the creator in that passage, because if that were the case, then the author of Hebrews and Paul and Colossians and, and other passages would be explicitly contradicting that passage in Isaiah, because the author of Hebrews and Paul and Colossians and other passages explicitly say that Jesus was involved in that creation. So I think when it says Yahweh alone created the heavens, stretched out the heavens and created the earth, it means God alone did so. Now, at the time, I think those authors conceived of the Father being that one, because I'm not one of these people who think thinks that the uh, authors of the Old Testament were Trinitarians. I think they were, um, I think they had a much more expansive view of God than Dr. Tuggy does, and they considered the possibility that he might have been multipersonal. In fact, uh, Dr. James Brown in his, or sorry, Dr. Michael Brown in his um, uh, Apologetics to Jewish uh, People books, he explains that there is, in fact, Jewish precedent for this kind of thing, um, that talk about the mysterious three-in-one and, and other similar such language. So I think it's possible that the Old Testament authors 
Mars had a more forgiving view, I suppose, of God than Dr. Tuggy does, but I don't think they were Trinitarians. So when the Old Testament author writes Yahweh saying, I alone created the heavens, I alone stretched out the heavens and, and created the earth, I think they had in mind the Father, but I think that the point is that the being that is God is the sole creator. And as I've argued and I think demonstrated tonight, Jesus is equally that one divine being. Dr. James Brown, now that's who I'd like to see in a debate. That would be really interesting. I mean, I think I just heard two different answers there, that it's really the Father they have in mind. Oh, and it's also both of them, or just whoever happens to have divine nature. And uh, look, Yahweh is a personal name. It's always used with personal pronouns and singular verbs. I mean, Yahweh is a self in the Old Testament, and we find out that this turns out to be, in the New Testament, the one called the Father, because they don't use the divine name anymore. Or the Lord God is another way to call him. So, I mean, when he says he does it by himself, that's the same as the father doing it by himself. Mr. Day granted that, but he also said, well, they must really think it's just whatever beings have divine nature were involved in it. So no one outside of God, something like that, did it. That's just not part of their conceptual uh, framework. Dr. Tuggy, if you were to argue for the opposite view, that is Chris's view, what additional arguments can you put on the table beyond what Chris has already stated? Um, in one way, it's a hard question to answer because I haven't seen any good arguments for the deity of Christ. They're all ambitiously speculative and leaping beyond the text, and they don't fit the context of the first century or the book as a whole or that author as a whole. I mean, what most people would do is they would say, look, Jesus is called God, right? If you're called God, like, what more proof do you need, bro? That's ignorant of biblical terminology. Uh, hey, Jesus is called Lord. Lord is what they use instead of the divine name in the New Testament. This is argued by many people. Again, it's ignorant of New Testament terminology. There's a new use of kurios and ha kurios in the New Testament. It's based on Psalm 110.1, the most cited Old Testament verse in the New Testament. The Lord here is not God himself, and it's not just sir or master. It's, it's this Lord Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, in contrast to the one God. Um, other people get fancy with fulfilled prophecies, and they say, hey, look, originally this prophecy was about God, that is to say the Father, the Lord. This New Testament author says Jesus fulfills it, and so they're hinting that Jesus really is God himself. Uh, this just misunderstands how New Testament authors use the Old Testament. They're saying usually that it's God working through Jesus and or there's a new interpretation. So for instance, this prediction about Emmanuel, it had a fulfillment back in the time of Isaiah, but it has a second new fulfillment in the time of Jesus, according to Matthew. So it's a mistake to think that the authors are identifying Jesus with the God of Israel just because Jesus fulfills prophecies that were in the original context about the God of Israel. But I'm very glad I didn't have to hear arguments like that tonight. I think that might be the only thing I've heard Dr. Tuggy say he's glad he didn't hear from me tonight, um, and I'm happy to take that. I don't have much to say uh, to this point except to say that I think there are other good arguments that we haven't had time to discuss. For example, there's nothing about dual fulfillment of prophecy when the authors of the New Testament compare the relationship between Jesus and church to the relationship between God and his people in the Old Testament such that to not follow Christ is idolatry. The only way that even makes sense is if Jesus is in fact incarnate Yahweh, and if you are interested more in that argument, I would encourage you to check out the work of Dr. Chris. Tilling, uh, who has written on this topic. But one final comment I want to just add here in his, in his answer to the last question, or his follow-up to my answer to the question, Dr. Tuggy said that there are tons of first-person uh, singular pronouns and that Yahweh is a personal name, but of course, anytime you speak to any being, you, you can't speak to the being, you speak to the person who has that being. And so, of course, and, and if they only conceive of God as being one person at the time, then of course, it's going to be singular pronouns. There's nothing legitimate and significant about that. This is for Mr. Date. Do you believe that the belief in the deity of Christ is essential to salvation? I had a feeling I would get asked a question like this, and the short answer to that question is yes. 
But since I've got two minutes, I'd like to offer a slightly longer version of that answer to the question. I don't think that in order to be saved, one has to have a full understanding of the entirety of Christian doctrine. I don't even necessarily think that somebody who is going to be saved has to immediately then and there understand all of the essentials of the gospel. I mean, I think it's at least conceivable that all it takes to be saved for somebody like me who, who was raised in, as an atheist and never had any exposure to Christian doctrine or anything like that, to simply accept that Jesus died on my behalf, to place my trust in him, and to be willing to profess that, uh, and, and rather than just sort of hide what I believe, I think that suffices. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's all that's essential in a more um, ongoing sense. What I would argue is that if somebody persists ongoingly in denying the deity of Christ, which as I demonstrated was essential to Christianity according to the early fathers and the writers of the ecumenical creeds, if somebody persists over time in denying it despite the fact that all of their arguments have been rebutted, as has been the case tonight, and despite the fact that Trinitarian and incarnational doctrines have not been rebutted, which has been the case tonight, despite all of that, if somebody continues to persist in doing so, I do think it's, a, it's an indication that somebody is not truly born again. But I can't see people's hearts, only God can, and I think it's conceivable that somebody who is a Unitarian, many Unitarians I think are probably saved, but I don't think that means that it's not essential to the Christian faith. The early fathers certainly thought that it was definitional of Christian faith, uh, and they codified it in the creeds to which all Christians have agreed since that time. So um, yes, I think it's essential, but I don't think that means you have to believe it at the time you're saved if you're going to be saved. But I would caution people from ongoingly persisting in denying it when it's been demonstrated that it's, uh, that it's true. I mean, it's ludicrous to claim that the deity of Christ in the sense understood from the fourth century on is so clear in the Bible that you're blameworthy if you don't agree with it. You should tell that to all the people who had all these arguments in the 100s, 200s, and 300s about this. I mean, the mainstream Christians, not like Gnostics and whatever. Um, I think most evangelicals have a little bit of a guilty conscience about this. They know that the tradition says this is essential, but they don't think it's really essential. You're going to get saved at a Billy Graham conference or you're taught the gospel as an eight-year-old. They don't tell you that about Jesus having two natures. In fact, this is just a confused and confusing bunch of theories, and we kind of keep them on the down low just instinctively. We certainly don't agree with things like the Athanasian Creed, nor should we. Again, Peter skips it, and if it's essential to the gospel, he failed to preach the gospel in Acts 2, but he didn't. Mr. Date, what does it mean in Philippians 2 that the Son gave up something when joining to human nature? Maybe. Um... Before I answer that question, I just want to point out that in his follow-up to my answer to the previous question, Dr. Tuggy said that as evidence that the incarnation of Christ is not essential to the gospel is the fact that there were a lot of arguments about what is codified in those early creeds at the time that they were codified. But notice I didn't say that the Trinity as formulated by those creeds is essential to the faith. What I said is the deity of Christ is. And you can see that in the Church Fathers from as far back as you can possibly go, as I demonstrated in my opening presentation. These difficulties coming up with explanations to account for this biblical teaching that Jesus is Yahweh incarnate, that explains the arguments. They couldn't understand how to make sense of it, but they believed it to be true. And they just struggled to make sense of it in light of monotheism, or at least that's my position. Anyway, so in answer to the question, he doesn't say Jesus gave up anything. Emptied himself is, he doesn't mean literally. Uh, emptied himself is a metaphor that Paul is using, and he tells you in context what he means by it. He's giving, he's setting aside the privilege of being worshipped and the, and the privilege of being glorified and so forth. He's putting those aside in order to humble himself and, and become a human being in order to serve God and to serve others. Again, I think kenosis theories and, and other hyper-literal treatments of, of Paul's statement that Jesus emptied himself, I think are mistaken. And, and I suspect that on that point, Dr. Tuggy and I will agree. It doesn't say he actually gave something up. It just, it's, the, it's the metaphor of emptying a container to mean that he gave up the privilege of, privilege of being glorified and worshipped. Amen. Nothing was literally given up. He tells you what he means in the same verse. Did we just agree on something? <laughs> okay, and our final question. Let me interpret this one here for us. How do you explain 1 Timothy 2.5? I'm sorry, this is for Mr. Date. I don't think I said that. How do you explain why in 1 Timothy 2.5 he does not say that Jesus is God, but explicitly and specifically calls him man? <laughs> 
If I understand the question is, why does uh, Paul tell Timothy that there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus? Why doesn't he call him God? Well, I don't know. Uh, he calls him God elsewhere in the sense of saying he existed in God's form and that he didn't consider his equality with God uh, 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 an advantage to exploit. So he does so elsewhere. I don't think the fact that he doesn't do so here, I don't think that's significant. I think that if you try to use that as an argument for Unitarianism and against the deity of Christ, I think that you are doing the very kind of reading between the lines of scripture that Dr. Tuggy accused me of doing and which he did in his opening presentation. So I would just encourage you to be more careful with the text. The fact that an author doesn't say something doesn't mean that they don't think it's true. What matters is what they do say, not what they don't say. One of the things that shook me up from just assuming that clearly Jesus is God and clearly has two natures and only a bad cultist would deny it was I noticed that there were many linguistic facts about the way New Testament writers use language, and this is one of them. They don't feel any need to qualify when they say that he's man or that he's human. Trinitarians and believers in two natures, they immediately feel the need to follow that up lest you think he's merely a man. And there's got to be something bad about that. They don't have that anxiety. Occasionally, Trinitarians will even slip up and they'll say, oh, he's not a man, he's God. And what they mean is that he's not a mere man, right? But you don't, you don't see that in the New Testament. So, I mean, it fits in with the whole picture. He's explicitly a man, he's not explicitly a god. That he's in the form of God in Philippians 2 does not prove that he's divine in the sense that these theorists are talking about. Mr. Date seems to think it, it does entail that. All right, thank you both very much. At this time, we are going to be bringing our debate to a close. So can we maybe have a round of applause for our two debaters this evening? And I do want to thank all of you for being here with us and all of those online who joined us as well. And uh, again, a special thank you to Dr. Tuggy and Mr. Day for all of the hard work that they've put in to their preparation this evening. Doubtless everyone who has been listening has found many of the answers they're looking for and at the very least discovered new questions uh, for themselves to pursue on their own. So thank you to both of you and thank you also for your good Christian spirit and professionalism during this debate. It was much appreciated. I'd also like to thank once again the organizers of tonight's event, Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions, and our sponsors, Restoration Fellowship, 21st Century Reformation, the Minnesota Missionary Society, and House Light Ministries, as well, of course, as Pine Grove Bible Church and the Church of God General Conference for hosting us. And I would like to remind everyone once again that ICTHIS Publications will be publishing a book later this year based on this debate. So if you enjoyed this debate, please be sure to look for and pick up that book, which will go much farther and wider into this topic. You will definitely not want to miss it. And uh, again, there are books on the back table back there for you to take a look at and hopefully purchase. Uh, so please check out some of that material and support our debaters and our sponsors. So that's it for us this evening. And again, thank you so much. God bless you and keep you safe on your travels back home. Have a good night. I think this was a very substantial debate. The disagreements were profound. The approaches were quite different. And so many issues were raised that were hard to think through just on a first listen. I'm looking forward to getting to the bottom of some of the issues raised in the book version. About a week after this podcast comes out, I've agreed to go on a webcast to discuss this debate. So look out in the Trinity's podcast group on Facebook for a link to that. And also you can look at trinities.org. Thanks again to Mr. Date and to all the people who made this debate possible. I hope it's proven helpful to you as you've been thinking about these issues. This week's thinking music has been the track Warm Vacuum Tube by Admiral Bob. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. 
Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.